subconsciously be blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something that happened to us in the past or, the, or for something that is happening to us right now. So uh, there's a difference again between disagreeing with something wrong and disapproving of Allah subhanahu, wa uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and his qadr. And again, to clear the fog, we have to move into acceptance. We have to close our eyes and say, Oh Allah, I accept what you have decreed. Qadr Allah ma sha'a fa'al. I accept it. Help me to respond to the situation in the way that you're the most pleased with. When you embrace reality, that's very different than fleeing from it or disapproving of it. It actually moves you into empowerment. And again, it clears the fog. The second one is to have a focus on you know, the things that you're grateful for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about guidance in the Qur'an, uh, he usually associates it with those who are grateful. When he talks about disbelief, he associates it with those who deny uh, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thinking about it in terms of every day, am I in a negative state of mind? Am I complaining always in my mind about all of my difficulties? Or am I someone who can magnify the good? I can look at something good and magnify it. And subhanAllah, sometimes when people are trying to be humble and Allah allows them to do something good, they try to minimize it so that they can feel, again, like they're not so important or not so good or what have you. So a sister, for example, may be, you know, be an organizer for a conference like this. And afterwards, I might tell her, wow, you did such an amazing job. May Allah reward you. And then she'll say, I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing. And I'm like, no, don't say I did nothing. Because part of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acknowledging and magnifying your blessings. So recognize that this is a big thing. But say alhamdulillah. Say the good of this is from Allah. It didn't come from me. It was a blessing. It was from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So magnifying the good always in our lives. Now if we magnify the good and associate to ourselves, that becomes a form of arrogance. But if we magnify the good and always return the credit back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that makes us feel so humbled and so grateful and always uh, thankful really for, for the blessings that we have. The opposite of that, as we mentioned before, is to really only see the bad. I'm, it's, I'm, and I'm not saying not to recognize difficulties or challenges, but I'm saying where you shift, what your heart is focused on, is what will fuel uh, you know, the, 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 your inner state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, gratitude is a pillar of, uh, of showing our appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the third one is actually something interesting, especially in our day and age. It's to have time for khalwa. To have time where you really get away from everything and have alone time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was something Dr. Samira mentioned. She said, today, how many times does a person actually stop everything they're doing and just make sincere, heartfelt dua to Allah? Now in khalwa, it doesn't mean that you just have to make dua. There's a lot of things that a person can do in khalwa. But in this society, we're always encouraged to be out. Be out. And even if you're inside by yourself, you can't be by yourself. You need to be on your cell phone. You need to be on Facebook, on Twitter, on the other Instagram, whatnot. You need to never feel alone by yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what this society is telling us. But in order to clear the fog, we have to be, our heart has to be focused on Allah, not focused are not so attached to the material world and we need alone time to do that. So if you're a busy mom, sometimes the only time you have is at the very end of the evening, after all the kids are asleep, even spend five minutes of alone time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is quality time, it's gonna have an impact on clearing the fog and helping you have perspective with the different challenges you face. The fourth one is muhasaba, uh, to take one account of oneself. And also, again, in this society, we usually try to be in denial of things. We are like being wrong or um, having shortcomings is seen as such a uh, something that you would flee from. Even our nafs wants us to flee from taking account of ourselves. But muhasaba is so powerful if it's done the right way because as you examine yourself, don't just examine the things you did wrong. Don't just look at the chains. Also, look at the things you did right. And when a person has that balanced approach, they know where they stand. They know where they are. And of course, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, really knows where we are. But at least you're aware of it. At least you're aware of, uh, you know, let's say, for example, if you're, if you're doing muhasaba every evening before you go to sleep, you think about, for example, the sins of the tongue. And you say, you know what? Every day this week, I backbited. I have a backbiting problem. That's something that you can only recognize about yourself if you're taking account. Number five is to have 
a person or people that you can be spiritually honest with that can hold you accountable. So not only do you hold yourself accountable with uh, you know, personal accounting, but also you need either a murabbi, a spiritual advisor, a mentor, or if you don't have access to one, and in this community you have access to many, by the way, um, uh, if you don't have a murabbi you have access to that, that you can go to or you feel comfortable going to, then to have a sincere friend who has two qualities. One, they love you unconditionally. They really care about your well-being. So they're not a frenemy. They have to be someone who really sincerely loves you for the sake of Allah and really cares about you. And the other quality is that they push you to be better. They're someone that when you see them, their example, the way they, let, they live, pushes you or encourages you to be better. It reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is someone that you would tell that this is something I'm working on. For example, you might tell someone, I'm really trying to not watch television at all. Let's say this is your, the habit you're trying to get rid of. And you tell this to your, either your murabbi or your, uh, your friend. They, but just by saying it to someone gives you so much motivation to be able to work on that quality. Because so long as you're only working on it with yourself, sometimes you feel like you don't have enough support. But your friend or your murabbi will encourage you. They'll give you words of support when you need it. If you slip, they'll remind you to have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's really important to have someone like this in your life that you can turn to with the specific spiritual goals that you have. Number six is to have himma alia or to have uh, very high ambitions, not necessarily from a material perspective, but from in the, in the way that you want to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and this is important. The difference is a person can, two people can be doing the exact same thing. Two people are trying to get a PhD. One person is trying to get their PhD because this makes them appear successful in society, this pleases their parents, this, I don't know, it, this wins them social acceptance. Another person is getting their PhD because this is their way of serving the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what they want to do as an act of worship for him. This is something they want to show him on the day of judgment and say, Oh Allah, I did this for you. So himma alia is to choose lofty goals in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And never think something is too big when your goal is Allah. If your goal is this life, it's always going to be too big, too hard, too difficult. But if your goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the difficulties on that path, you're going to cherish and you're going to love and they're going to be very dear to you because that struggle was for him and not for your nafs. The seventh is at-tawadu, uh, humility. So obviously arrogance would be fog and humility is a clarity of that fog. A good way to sort of conceptualize humility is not just uh, you know, walking around sort of shame, uh, full of shame. That's not humility. Actually the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he would walk, he was someone that he walked so fast they said that it was as if, if the earth was a carpet it would roll up under his feet. So he had a mission. Um, but humility is really to be someone who, uh, as Imam Hassan al-Banna said, he said, uh, expect less than what you deserve and you will get what you deserve. Expect less than what you deserve and you will get what you deserve. So it's to fight the tendency of the shaitan to put in this waswasa of uh, entitlement. And entitlement is not achievement, okay? Entitlement is some feeling like people owe you something. People, you deserve something from the people. You have to get rid of this. And subhanAllah, whenever you look at, uh, you know, tazkiyah in Islam, one of the biggest sort of pillars of it is to have something, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's when you have something, but you're controlled uh, with regards to it. So a person can be very wealthy, uh, and they spend on themselves and their family, but they're not extravagant. Or a person can have all the food in the world, but they deliberately don't eat everything because they have a sense of personal discipline. So a humility, a person can have all of the accolades, whatever it is, the worldly successes on their resume, but when they deal with the people, they realize they were created from dust just like everyone else and that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where they stand. So humility, subhanAllah, uh, Imam Shafi'i would say he would never enter a room without feeling like everyone else in that room was better than him. You know, this is Imam Shafi'i. None of us here are Imam Shafi'i, so imagine what that means for us. I can't emphasize this enough because we live in a culture of entitlement. We really live in a culture of entitlement. And I mean, I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but this is a very long discussion when it comes to scholarship, when it comes to uh, the way that we treat teachers and the way that we treat activists. 
Number eight is, subhanAllah, this is something that is so important. And I have seen with my own eyes people be elevated in this life because of this simple, simple quality. And there's a narration of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that really emphasizes how this simple quality is so big in terms of our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and that's to have a heart that has only goodwill for people. A heart that only has goodwill and it's full of mercy. So think of Rahmah and think of Rahmah as expressed through Dua. Okay, so think about yourself and think about the people that you could be upset with and you have grudges with or they did something to you that was wrong. Maybe it's in-laws, maybe it's people at work. And to just be able to clear that from your heart, whether, they, whether they're wrong or they're right. And to have nothing but mercy for them. And this is really hard to reach, especially if you've been heavily wronged by someone. Um, but it's a way of actually you, you know, drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have mercy for people not necessarily because they deserve it. We have mercy for them because Allah loves for us to show compassion and mercy and it is an invitation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have that mercy upon us too. The opposite of that is someone who has hiqt, someone who just has like this, this hatred or this anger that they will just never let go. And this enmity is actually a sign of ignorance. It's part of the fog. Again, to clear the fog, think of someone that you wish could forgive you, that hasn't forgiven you. And you should just make du'a for them. Think about someone that you find hard to forgive and just sit and make du'a for them until Allah gets rid of the malice in your heart. Number nine, khidmah, to be in the service of others. And the opposite of this is to be selfish and be only in the service of yourself. So to be in the service of others is actually, um, it's kind of an illusion because you think that you're serving others but, or you're helping others, but truly when you help others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's helping you. We know this is one of the 40 hadith from Imam Nawawi that Allah is in the aid of his servant so long as the servant is in the aid of his brother. And Imam Nawawi actually talks about when the word brother is used in certain ahadith and he says it's not just your brother in Islam. It's your brother in humanity. So be someone who is in the khidmah of others. And particularly for tazkiyah, it's recommended to choose something that you struggle with. So some, let's say there's a, there's a way that you uh, are, let's say, not balanced in your personal life. Then do an active khidmah that has to do with that act, uh, that imbalance, because it helps purify it from you. So as an example, I'll give you an example. Some people like to spend a lot of money on shoes, right? like an, a, an exorbitant amount of money on shoes. They'll spend like $300 on a pair of shoes. All right, if that's the disease, let's say, if that's the attachment, if that's the fog, then go out of your way to go and buy shoes for poor people or make sure you poor people who can't afford to have shoes either in your area or internationally have access to shoes. And it's subhanAllah, when you associate it with something that you're actually struggling with, it does become a form of purification. It shows you how petty the attachment is or the chain is. Number 10 is sidq, is to be honest. And specifically to be honest when we make mistakes with others and when we make mistakes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the ability to say I'm sorry when you're wrong and the ability to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we have not fulfilled his, uh, his rights upon us. It comes from a place of honesty. It comes from a place of total surrender and honesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that really does clear the fog. Uh, a lot of times we are in denial about the different things that we do. As soon as you stand in salah, look into your heart and allow it to be honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, that, and it's, a, it's something that should motivate you to repent to Allah in the prayer itself. And after the prayer is done, to go back and apologize to those you've harmed. Even people you think you may have harmed, but you're not sure about, but you, maybe you hurt their feelings. Even in those cases, you know, if, if you're afraid, because people are always worried about what will they think? What will they think? What will they think? If you approach someone and your motivator is truly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will bless that interaction. And if, the, and, if that per, and if you go to someone and you apologize for what you did wrong and they respond with vile behavior, when it's truly for Allah, it doesn't hurt that much. It'll hurt a little bit, but it won't hurt that much because you didn't necessarily do it for them. You did it because this is what Allah wants from you. You did it to be honest. Uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 11 is tajdeed, is to never let our spiritual lives become dull and boring. Never take on, never, never get to a place of complacency where you're just like, you know, I'm fine, I have my job, I have my family, I just live, I just enjoy things. You have to have a, a desire for a renewed sense of purpose. 
And uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu once described even our faith as, as uh, a piece of cloth that needs to be renewed, uh, you know, needs to be washed, needs to be cleansed and uh, made vibrant again. So uh, events like this, this conference is one of the methods at which we, uh, you know, attempt tajdeed with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If we are sincere, if we come here and we say, oh Allah, I have come here to benefit from a word that could draw me closer to you, Allah will bring something into your heart that will be a form of tajdeed and renewal for you. A lot of times people want to blame an event for not being affected, blame the intention in your heart. There's always a way to benefit if you're intending Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So uh, whether it's a, a conference, whether it's a camp or a retreat, whether it's the Friday khutbah, whether it's a, a, a halaqa, you know, always go look into different ways of drawing closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I, I believe everyone should always be reading a book of tazkiyah throughout the year because it's such, even if it's you're only reading two or three pages a day, it's such a cleanser. It's something that always brings perspective to whatever problem you're dealing with. It doesn't matter if you're a scholar or a five-year-old. If there's something that is dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and drawing closer to, to Him, all of us are in need of that reminder and there are plenty of books that we can recommend. Uh, the twelfth and final um, step is to practice overflowing unconditional love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I would call this hub fillah. You know, imagine if you are a sponge that is soaked in water, and if someone were to just poke that sponge, the only thing that's going to come out is water. Imagine that that's how you are, but that, that's not water inside. That is love and mercy that you want to just spread. You know, you're overflowing with it. You want anyone who, who comes near you to have an experience of that love and mercy and compassion because you know this is an invitation of the love and compassion and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you. And something that's really beautiful about um, practicing love for Allah with your brothers and sisters is that uh, you experience the sweetness of faith. It's not just that you're doing something for others, it's that you, the one who is doing that is the one who is elevated through it, is the one who is in a state of enjoyment, is the one who is in a state of total happiness. It's one of the categories of having the sweetness of Iman. And so these are just 12 things that I wanted to recommend uh, in terms of clearing the fog. Um, there's also something that I wanted to mention that's important in this regard, and I only have a minute to do it. But whatever habit you're working on, whatever habit you're working on, and uh, try to work on it with your murabbi or with your, you know, your, your really good friend that you can trust. Um, work on it for 40 days. Try to do it for 40 days straight. Every time you slip, go back to day one. And that sounds really hard, but this is a lifelong path. Self-purification is a lifelong path. And subhanAllah, something that's amazing about a sincere intention is that sometimes as soon as you intend to stop doing it, you literally stop doing it, whatever it is. Sometimes Allah blesses you with that. Other times you may slip and slip and slip, but eventually you stop doing whatever it is. And people are supposed to move from one stage to another very quickly. We move from a stage of disbelief to belief. We move from a stage of the haram into the halal. We move from the stage of what is doubtful to what has no doubt. We move from the stage of being involved in excesses to a stage of moderation. And finally, we move to a stage of having our heart focused only on and attached only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the words of Imam Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi. I didn't present the majority of my talk because I always over-prepare. But whatever is beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever is wrong and mistaken is from my and the shaitan and I also wanted to recommend there's an amazing book that I just uh, read recently and it's really really powerful um, it's called agenda to change our condition and this is by uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Imam Zaid Shakir agenda to change our condition it's a very small book it's something that I recommend if you're sitting in a halaqa study this book together with your halaqa go chapter by chapter and study it together for no less than a month I would say at least two months, and then the practice is they have little, um, they have a muraqaba schedule in the back about how to get rid of your bad habits. And again, Jazakum Allah Khair, very honored to spend this time with you. Assalamu alaikum.